All right, we are just about to be live. Okay. Beth and Kelly, so good to see you guys. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so good to see you. So before we went live, you were just talking about how it's been almost a year since you wrote your chapter. Uh, and I mentioned that you were actually the first to give me your draft. Um, so out of, out of all of the 22 <laughs> chapters in the book, um, you were first. Um, and I have to say that it has uh, aged incredibly well because uh, as events have unfolded over the past year, um, I think that trauma-informed practices in schools, uh, social emotional learning, um, making sure that our schools are trauma-informed, those have really come to the forefront because of some of the, the things that have happened in our society. So thank you for being so prescient and so timely. <laughs> we our best. Yeah, sure thing. <laughs> so why don't we start with, um, with talking about, uh, let's define what trauma is, because I think there's some misunderstandings in there and there's some confusion because of all those different terms that I just threw out there, trauma-informed practices, social emotional learning, mental health. Um, when we're talking specifically about trauma, what are, what are we dealing with? Beth, you want to take that one since you are the researcher? I would be glad to. So trauma we often see as the experience leading to action or impact. And so for many individuals in our society, and we want to make sure that this is not limited just to children, but even in the book, we are speaking about children. Um, trauma is the physical, the mental, the emotional manifestation of experiences, of conditions, and of narratives that have been placed upon individuals. And so those physical manifestations may include, especially in our youngest learners, um, lack of physical control, moments when there's not a cognitive kind of connection to what their body is doing. We also see, and I, I would love for Kelly to speak a little bit about um, attachment disorders. We see um, different manifestations within mental health and with processing relationships that occur, and also with general emotional well being. So um, wide ranges of emotions, often um, a term that is used is called flip the switch. So you often see that um, young people and adults will um, immediately shift what they are doing emotionally and can do so quickly because of how their brain has been conditioned. So a lot of what we learned about trauma has been about brain research. I could go on about that for a long time. But Kelly, I'd love for you to speak a little bit more to kind of the, the impacts of what that might look like for our kids. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I used to uh, work at an alternative high school, and so we had students there who um, had experienced educational trauma in addition to possible personal trauma, and that can obviously impact how you are in the classroom. And so if you've had educational trauma, which is, um, you know, experiencing things in, in the classroom setting or in a school that causes trauma, then, you know, anything that happens then in school could potentially trigger that trauma. And if you've had personal trauma, then it's the same thing, you know, where your brain chemistry, which I think, Beth, you might go into that a little bit more in the, in the chapter, but like your brain chemistry can actually be sort of different than someone who has not experienced trauma. And so you might be triggered by something, you might experience something differently than someone who hasn't experienced trauma might. Um, and you had talked about attachment disorders and you know everyone has an attachment system. Um, ideally it's secure attachment. It, it's really determined by your relationship with your caregivers in, in the first few years of your life and how they respond to your needs. Uh, but some of our students and some of our adults um, are not, they do not have those needs met in the ways that they need to, so they can develop different kinds of attachment disorders. And, and when we have students with attachment disorders, that is going to make uh, learning super hard sometimes, because if a teacher says something or does something or, or changes their affect, um, or something might be in the curriculum, or, you know, there's so many different things that can happen, or if a student feels shame or, or whatever, like that can get triggered, and then you might have like a distorted uh, version of sort of what's happening, but to you it feels real, and so it matters. Um, and so uh, when teachers are aware of that, they can sort of help students navigate through uh, what I what I call like a trauma brain, which which you can get triggered, and then you're not going to learn when you're triggered into your trauma brain. Yeah, so um, I'm struck. I, I did a panel discussion on um, how we how we help schools become more trauma informed a couple of weeks ago, and one of the panelists on there talked a lot about the behaviors that we see in school, um, and how uh, often those behaviors are misinterpreted by teachers. 
Um, and, and the root cause of those behaviors is often something that we don't know anything about. So talk a little bit about how being trauma informed in our practice in our classrooms, um, how we get to those, uh, those, those traumas that students have experienced, those lived experiences that have caused them and, and how we can react better to some of the behaviors that we see in, in our classrooms. Beth, did you wanna start? Yeah, I'll be glad to. So um, first, I'm glad that you were able to, <laughs> to speak to the idea that behavior is often a communication or a story untold. Um, I can relate this back to my experience with my students. So it is not um, always clear to me the full narrative of students' lives and they walk into my music classroom. But I do know that what they are showing me and even in the smallest hints of how they are interpreting their stimulus around them and perceiving relationships and communicating with me can often give me a picture into what they have experienced. So um, with students who've experienced significant trauma and then have manifestations, um, as we mentioned with the physical, emotional and mental um, differences in how they might act in accordance to their peers. Um, some teachers can interpret that as something that is disruptive rather than that is communicative. Um, something that I've learned quite a bit over the past few years is that a trauma-informed classroom is one that is not based upon a firm authority or some means of controlled behavior or any type of um, colonial imprints um, on student action. And so that's that's been a really powerful piece for me to look through is that in, in my instruction, those behaviors that are happening oftentimes are just manifestations of, of narratives and of experiences that kids may not be able to vocalize on their own. Yep. And I think creating that safe space like Beth does in her music class where students can tell you what their needs are, tell you what they're going through. And Michael, I mean, you asked sort of like knowing about their trauma and I know you like sometimes we just won't, you know, like, and that's okay. Like we don't need students to tell us about their trauma, but we, we can, we just need to know that they need something. And so if we're creating an environment where they feel like they can tell us that without shame, without, um, you know, being put down without judgment, you know, that if, if we meet that with curiosity, then they're going to be more likely to tell us what their needs are. And then it's going to be easier for us to help them navigate through those triggers when they are experiencing trauma. Um, and I think, you know, adults have trauma too. And, and some of our teachers might be triggered by situations. And so it's being aware as a, as an adult and as an educator too, like what, if you have a trauma brain, like what are you triggered by so that you're making sure that that's not coming out sideways um, on any of your students. Um, and so just, you know, really being, being aware of, of your management facilitation style too, which Beth already brought up. Um, I know that I used to, when things got chaotic, I would shift into sort of an authoritative mode uh, when normally I'm more of a coach. And I had some students that were reacting strongly to that. And, and some faculty said, why do you have so many blowups in your classroom? It doesn't make sense. And I had a couple options then. I could either go, oh, it's just, it's the students. Um, or I could go, oh, maybe I'm doing something. And, and, I, and I talked to students and, and, and then I, I actually made it my growth goal for the year and I went to workshops. And the thing that really got me is we had to do this quiz about what our style was, like our teaching style. And then at the very bottom in fine print, it said, if you have time, fill this out again, but like try to put your brain in the mode like when you're upset. Mm. or something bothers you in class. And so I did that and I was like, oh, I had a completely different teaching style when I, like, I felt like I, I had to get things under control and I became authoritative. And students who have trauma brains, if they know me as a coach and then all of a sudden I'm authoritative, like that's gonna trigger them because they don't know me anymore. Mm. And that's gonna cause some students who might not have as much distress tolerance or emotional regulation to blow up you know, with good reason, because they now don't trust me and they don't know what's happening. Um, and so I think that's a big key in this too, in helping students is not only being aware of what students need, but also being aware as an educator of how we are teaching and how we react to things and how that can impact our students and, and especially students with, with trauma brains. And, and I think that's, uh, that's such a good point. And actually, uh, Beth, I'm going to go back to something that you said in a minute, but I want to, I want to um, dive into what Kelly just talked about. Um, I think what you just mentioned about um, teachers understanding um, their experiences and understanding how they're dealing with them and how that relates to their students has always been important, 
but is, is almost more important than ever right now because of the upheaval that we see in society, whether it's with COVID, whether it's with the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's, uh, there's, there's all of these triggers happening in society. Um, you know, the Supreme Court decision that came down, uh, all of these are trigger points for different people. Um, and teachers are bringing that to their classroom. And unless they're intentional about thinking about how that impacts them and how that relates to kids, um, that could have some really devastating uh, effect. Mm -hmm. But Beth, I want to I want to go back to something that you said before, um, and you were and, and what I thought about your chapter quite a bit is um, it was clear to me how important this chapter was in a book about the health of democracy and education's role in it from the beginning. But I think to to the average person thinking about an outline uh, of a book on that topic, trauma informed practices might not necessarily be something that they connect that with, and. Um, you mentioned in there, in our, in our classroom structures, to really do this well, to be good educators, to have a good trauma-informed classroom or environment, um, that we have to understand power structures and that we have, to under, we have to flatten the hierarchy, right? You didn't use those words, but I'm going to use them. And so many times when I've explained what flipping the system means in education, um, I've used that exact term, right? We need to flatten the hierarchy, and instead of it being coercive and top-down, um, we need to make sure that it's based on inspiration and support. Um, everyone asking uh, others in the system, what can we do to help you be successful? And it strikes me that that is very similar to what you're describing a trauma-informed classroom looks like. Do you want to comment on that just a little bit? Absolutely. So I kind of want to revisit what you just spoke to, though, the, mm -hmm. the teacher self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pieces that we look at, as Kelly, you mentioned, you know, investigating your teaching style, your teaching story, sometimes teachers, and okay, sometimes I, particularly earlier in my career, felt that when I walked into my classroom, I was this separate entity um, who was not necessarily putting any of myself into the content that the content spoke for itself. Musicians are often like that. I'm seeking to move past, <laughs> past that mindset. Um, but for, um, for me, I know that when I walk into the classroom, I bring my biases, I bring my story, I bring my own experience with education. I bring my experience with authority in general. I bring my perceptions upon morality and I project that through my teaching. And so as teachers begin to understand the hierarchies and the power struggles and the power shifts within a classroom, self-identity work is absolutely vital. So, and I know that we have several um, other chapters that allude to that as well, but the impact of, of educators upon the um, power dynamics, but within the classroom, and again, I'm an elementary music teacher, it still means though, that my young students must have agency and voice in my classroom. If I am seeking to impart something on them rather than partner with them to create a learning environment where they can succeed, where they have choice, um, then I am continuing to impart then my own authority structures. So, and I know Kelly, you've talked about before, you, you're amazing at doing this with your kids and really helping them elevate their voices. So love to hear you share. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I really like what you're saying about in part versus partner with. Um, and, and, you know, you're speaking a lot to sort of being student centered versus teacher centered. And, um, you know, I, I, it took me a while to really jump onto the voice and choice train. And I was real hesitant for a while because I think, you know, as a teacher, I felt like I had to be the expert in my content. I had to know exactly what plays they should read, what texts they should read, you know, what assignments they should do. Um, and once I let go of that and gave more voice and choice, uh, turns out students enjoyed learning more, uh, which, you know, shocking. Uh, but it, it, you know, because adults are the same way. If we have choices, like we, we engage in, in what we're doing more. And, and then I figured out that I didn't even necessarily have to read every article or every book that the students were writing about um, because they could teach me about it. Because I was looking, I wasn't doing like multiple choice, what color is this person's shoe in the second chat? Like, you know, so the stuff that I was looking for was having them analyze literary elements. And so, you know, I was able to ascertain from their answers if they were, if they were understanding that, but then they'd come to class and want to teach me about whatever documentary they watched or whatever book they read or, and so I think that's a lot of, of, of it too. What you're saying is, you know, being student centered in that way is, is providing that, that choice for students. And I think I really like what you said about when you walk into the room, being aware of sort of what you're carrying with you. Um, and, and I know, 
like another thing is obviously privilege like that you know as a when I, I worked at a school that was predominantly students of color and I'm white presenting I'm a descendant of Cherokee people but I'm white presenting and so when that student is meeting me that first day um, like I have to be aware of what their experiences have been of what um, you know of the of the privilege that I bring with me when I walk into that room and the associations that might be connected to me because I'm white presenting and that that's real and that that's not the student's fault and it's not necessarily my fault but to not be aware of it and not own it and not be sensitive to it is not serving the needs of our students and again this is all connected to trauma too because if they've had educational trauma and experienced racism or homophobia or transphobia or xenophobia from a teacher or from an educator like I need to be aware of that when they walk into the room to make sure that I'm creating a safe space so that they know that they're not going to have that same experience from me. Yeah, and, and you're starting to, uh, I'm sorry, Beth, did you want to jump in there? Oh, I, I'm terrible <laughs> interrupting on Zoom. This is a TV platform. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. But, so so I think I think Kelly's, Kelly's leading us to a space, and, and Beth, I'll let you jump in in a second, and, and you can take us wherever you want to go. Um, but Beth is, or um, uh, Kelly's leading us to a space uh, to talk about the connection between uh, trauma and equity, right? Um, and being, and trauma-informed practices. And, and so far, we've really been talking about trauma-informed practices in our classrooms. But I want to take a, a wider lens um, as we discuss this and talk about trauma-informed schools in general. Um, and how we know that democracy can't be healthy unless uh, education is healthy, because if education is not supporting everyone, then we have an inequitable um, democracy, right? So, so we, have to get, uh, we have to get educational equity right in order to get democracy right. Um, so what is, what is the connection between um, making sure that our schools are, have a culture of, of trauma-informed practices and getting that educational equity piece right? Yeah. I'll be glad to jump in on that. So um, we are very tragically um, in a country that has a long trend of not being a trauma responsive to students. And that is often played out in our disciplinary practices with kids um, by not um, affirming individual stories, but also not partnering with, as you mentioned, Kelly, um, so that teachers can come alongside students and help give them strategies for the, the things that are they have experienced to no fault of their own. Um, but when we when we set up a standard that we tend to that we tend to think is holy, um, another word for that is our no tolerance policies, uh, which is not alone in schools, by the way, that's often existing in many parts of our justice system. But um, we we create an environment in which we we are not helping to facilitate reconciliation, restoration, and the skill building that will lead students forward. And so because of that, we have national trends, and I'm sorry to say in my state, state trends of our school to prison pipeline, that we are creating environment with environments in which students are immediately thrust into um, situations of incarceration because of the conditioning we've given them within school. And part of that is that educational trauma, this projection of authority, oftentimes um, through teacher actions, but also through curriculum. When students are not seen, when students are not heard, um, sometimes they will make themselves seen and heard. And I don't say that as a mm. challenge to youth. I say that as part of the nature of human spirit. And so it's our responsibility collectively, if we want our democracy to thrive to make sure that we are making our schools responsive which means that we are doing something to partner with students and families and partner with our community to make sure that there is healing taking place not a continual per perpetuation of injustices yeah i i 100 agree with everything that that beth is saying and i think to not you know to decrease educational trauma to not be the cause of, of educational trauma and i think like when we're talking about educational equity there's so many definitions out there and for me it's uh, finding out what students and educators need to be successful using a growth mindset academically social emotionally everything in between and then doing everything in our power to help them get those needs met um, and we know it's complex it's dynamic it's ongoing it's messy it's you know what Beth already said, owning your flaws and biases, um, and then engaging in courageous conversations to challenge prejudice and discrimination, creating the environments where students feel safe to share what they need, and then breaking down any systems that are creating those barriers. And I like to think of trauma informed as sort of like in the roots of the tree of educational equity. So in the roots, you've got trauma informed and cultural competency. You're using an intersectional equity lens. You've got restorative practices sort of in the core of the tree. And then the pedagogy is sort of up in the branches. 
So it's the environment, it's the instruction and facilitation, it's the curriculum. And to me, all of that is connected to that tree of educational equity. So if you're not having trauma-informed practices, you can't have equity, in my opinion. Hmm. So you've mentioned it a couple of times and you've given a couple of examples, but I really want to dive in a little deeper um, on how school can cause trauma. Um, and I'd imagine uh, we could give lots of different examples, whether it's um, reducing kids to uh, the number a number in a spreadsheet on a standardized test, or whether it's um, um, dealing with who they are as a person, right, um, and not recognizing that. But all of those, it seems to me, are questions of identity um, and not allowing students to find themselves or have their self be see them there. And I, I'm using self in the singular here uh, to to allow them their self uh, to be heard and seen in that educational space. Um, do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, you're right. It's, it can be very connected to identity. It can be, you know, like if you have a student who uh, is transgender and is not allowed to use the bathroom that they need to use, like that's going to cause trauma. That's going to cause not just trauma, but like physical you know, effects because there are students who are transgender who are not eating or drinking throughout the whole school day so they don't have to use the bathroom. Mm. They wait until they go home. That's trauma. If you're calling a student by the wrong pronouns and not using their affirmed pronouns, that's causing trauma. If you're, um, you know, kicking kids out or having low expectations of BIPOC kids at, at a disproportionate rate, which we know is happening statistically, that's causing trauma because then not only is that student missing that classroom time, but they are now getting singled out and shamed in front of the entire classroom that causes trauma. And, and, you know, in addition to teachers that are like, I had a student who told me that their teacher told them that racism was dead. They told this to a, a black male student that racism was dead. And he's like, it's not dead. You know, so even that is causing trauma, like refusing to acknowledge the experiences that our students are having. And I think it's important to talk about intersectionality and intersectional equity at this point too, because our kids are not one thing. So if you have a student who is black and transgender, that's a very different experience than a student who is a uh, white gay male, like, or whatever, like, you know, the different ways that our identities intersect are going to you know, affect our experiences and they're gonna affect our students' experiences. So again, this all comes back to equity. If we're paying attention to what our students need and who they are, then we're gonna be able to help them find success based on a growth mindset. And that is, and so trauma is like all involved in that tree with all of these other you know, sort of elements to consider. And I think it takes a, a careful consideration from every teacher to analyze not only what they're teaching. Cause again, I feel like so often we teach in these siloed um, concept cycles and it's, it's not healthy. And I know other parts of the books talk about that as well, but um, it's also about like how we are imparting that. And so when I think about um, curriculum and visibility within curriculum, um, I am very, very blessed to be teaching a content area in which I have freedom to design my curriculum. I acknowledge that many teachers in our country do not. And so we have to work with each other to help each other see how we are imparting that curriculum and what the message is. Um, I know there's been a lot of conversations conversations nationally recently about the lenses of, of how we teach history, of how we teach literature, about which voices we are choosing to honor. Um, and, and, and it's deeply important that our students not just see representation, because representation can also be a form of tokenism, but that they see themselves reflected, that they are given chances to understand more about who they are in an intersectional um, sense to, to then operate with better function within the classroom. They need that. Yeah. Um, going back to Kelly, to, to some of your examples there, it, it strikes me when we look at um, how schools can cause trauma, um, that there's many times situations where you could have a, a school that it, for, for the most part, most teachers are doing the work right, right? But there's one, one or two individuals in that school setting who are doing something egregious like uh, calling a transgender student by the wrong pronouns, right? And, and that if the entire school doesn't have a culture of being trauma-informed and inclusive, um, 
that the whole system could fall apart and we could cause real damage to individual students. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and that but, one thing that happens, like if even one of those things happens to a student, that can impact them for the rest of their lives. And then if you have administrators who are not supportive of all of those things, then the teachers, you know, even if you have a supportive teacher, but you don't have a supportive administrator, like that can also make things really challenging. So you're right. It is like everyone in that school needs to be trauma informed so that students can walk through their day and feel that support and feel seen so that they can get into their learning brains and so that they can get their credits and they can get their diploma because we know in our country that if you do not have a high school diploma you're very limited i used to do uh, case management with students who had dropped out of high school and it is hard to get housing it is hard to get employment like it is hard to function in our country without a high school diploma and so i think you know a lot of this is just making sure that students feel safe and seen and like they matter so that we can help them get what they need to have more options. So for the, oh, go ahead, Beth, you're gonna jump in. I won't interrupt you this time, I promise. I'm awful, again, interruptions. But um, something you said, Kelly, reminded me about, you know, we have a lot of teachers in our country who are, I'm, I'm thankful that they are investigating this road and they are wanting to understand how their, their own teaching can impact their students and how to partner with kids, help them build better strategies and how to celebrate resilience, but also to celebrate that we are all on journeys of different levels of brokenness, myself included. But we also have lots of teachers with a, like that who have colleagues who are not involved or administrators who are not involved. So we talk about this perpetuation, this school-wide culture. How do we involve others? You know, I, I think that sometimes in education, we tend to draw firm lines between grace and between accountability. Um, and that speaks to our discipline practices, that speaks to our grading practices and all of the structures that we put in place often as an industrialist mindset, but the structures that we put in place to manage the, the thing we call school, right? And, um, and so it's, it's important then that we take those structures, we break them down and we understand that there is grace in accountability and there's accountability in grace. And something that you just said reminded me, you know, if we have teachers who are perpetuating this, again, the system of inequities who are, um, isolating students um, who are separating them from their peers, who are intentionally um, calling students by their wrong names and trying to silence pieces of students' identities, um, it is going to cause further issues. But instead, maybe our approach can be with colleagues and with administrators to celebrate the balances of grace and accountability. That's something we don't often talk about in education. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's powerful and, and you took away one of my questions. I was gonna ask, what, what kind of structural changes should we look at? Um, but that's fine, because um, we're almost out of time and I have one last question that I think is probably uh, the most pressing for a lot of people watching right now. And that's if I am a classroom teacher that has not started to do this work, what are some small steps that I could take to get me on the right path? How can I start uh, creating a more trauma responsive classroom uh, to make sure that all of my students are included and well? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I would say a big piece of this is self-education. So you could buy Flip the System, United States edition, and <laughs> but, but self-education, understand um, early development within brain cycles, understand how different hormones are um, developing different pieces of the brain at different points. We want to make sure that we're understanding that when we're seeing these manifestations or behaviors or actions or thoughts coming out of students, that this can be associated with early experiences or current experiences of tragedy and trauma. Um, so it's a lot of self-education. Um, and I would also say that self-identity work is absolutely key, understanding our own stories. Um, you know, we, we as teachers, um, since we do come in with our own narratives, we can also, also, as Kelly mentioned, we can come in with our own experiences of authority and of trauma and of loss and of isolation and um, all of what we would call adverse childhood experiences that, that can impact the way that we react ourselves, even when students are, um, are experiencing moments of um, traumatic reflection and um, what we might call... Um, kind of episodes of dysregulation, right? And so um, our, our job is for that self-education, that self-identity work, and then to then carefully consider and filter through how we, every action that we take is impacting our students and how we can shift that toward this idea of restoration. Kelly, what would you say? 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's, there's that education piece. There's some really good books out there. There's uh, podcasts. There's, you know, there's a lot of way to educate yourself. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things you can do in the classroom too, is to lead with curiosity and heart. So, you know, one, one of the, with the conflict circle, it's basically like, if you, if you feel judgment or communicate judgment, that'll boost you into conflict quicker than anything else. That is what causes conflict is judgment. So if you can stay in that curiosity brain and lead with your heart, um, then it'll, it makes all the difference. And, that, and that's going to help with equity, big picture, every single part of equity, but especially with trauma. So if you have a student who is like, like Beth said, you know, acting out or behaving in a way that is uh, distracting for the class or, or for themselves, it's like, instead of having that immediate like judgment or annoyance or whatever is to be curious about it and to find out like, what is that? It means the student has a need that's not being met more often than not. And so it's taking the time to figure out what do you need? Like what's happening here. And if you can't do that right away, because like you're irritated because we're human, like I'll kick myself out of the classroom. I'll go to the bathroom. I'll take a lap until I can breathe and come with that energy of like, what do you need? You know? And, and I agree with Beth, like you have to have that grace with accountability. I call it compassionate accountability. Like you need both. Like, it, because this, you know, the student needs to be behaving in a way that's safe for themselves, safe for others. Uh, isn't distracting other people from learning like that is a, a baseline expectation, but there are ways to accomplish that without shaming the student. Um, you know, and having like those one on one conversations, whether it's in the hallway or in the classroom, if you're doing it in the hallway, obviously we like make sure you're doing a lot of positive ones too. So it doesn't feel like, you know, they're in trouble and that's a bad thing to be in the hallway. Um, sometimes you can just do it really easily in the classroom, just real quietly and just, you know, what do you need? Um, and, and I think that that can as, as a new teacher that's diving into that, Michael, like that is my biggest advice is to try to lead with curiosity and heart as much as possible. And you will be so happy and impressed with the, how quickly the, the culture changes in your classroom when you're able to do that. Well, I think that is uh, incredible advice from both of you. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. We are unfortunately out of time. I, I could talk to the two of you for uh, for so long. Both of you are just brilliant, and I'm so happy to have you as part of this uh, part of this book. Um, for those of you that are joined late, uh, I'm talking with Kelly D. Holstein and Beth Davy, co-authors on a chapter on um, the impacts of trauma on our youth in the new book that's coming out, Flip the System U.S., uh, how teachers can transform education and save democracy. Uh, thank you both uh, for, for not only your chapter, but also for taking some time with me today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Michael. I miss you both. <laughs> <laughs> miss you too.